You're mad. I'm back, back, back. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode here on the Kempire Radio Network. I'm so excited because I've been following this next artist's music for a few years now. Uh, so I was really excited to have her for a two-part uh, uh, interview here on the Kempire Radio Network, one for the Know Better, Do Better, Live Better series, but also for the Kempire Show every Friday here in the Kempire Radio Network. Please welcome, for the very first time, but not the first, first time that we played the music here on the, on the, the network, but welcome for the very first time for an interview, Mila Jam. What's going on? Hi, hello, and thank you for having me. <laughs> first of all, uh, you, you know we've played your music here on the Kempire Radio Network before. But this is the yes. first time that we've, we've had an interview. So I'm, we, there's a lot for us to talk about and catch up on. <laughs> I'm, yeah, we have, to, we have to build and catch up. And I'm excited to be here chatting with you. And thank you for playing my music and continuing to play the music because it's important to me. Definitely. So as I said to you um, beforehand, I want to first uh, talk about your story. How did this mm-hmm. all begin for you? How did, how did you get into you know, being a creative person? I don't want to just say a musician because I know you dance, you do a lot of different things. So how did, how did this all begin for you? Um, it's my whole life. I, I started um, you know, when I was like four. Uh, I, right. I, was, um, tra- I was training and taking dance classes, um, music lessons. Um, I was an actor when I was little. I was like a child actor, actually and had opportunities to actually go to LA and to start pursuing acting full time as a child actor. And the story goes that, you know, my mother raised me, um, she was a single parent. My parents got divorced when I was very young. And just the idea of her as a single mother moving to Los Angeles to sort of just take a whim and uh, take a crack at the the Hollywood business didn't really seem fitting at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it just, we just, took a different route, you know, and I grew up in the South, uh, primarily with my um, grandmother. Mm -hmm. So my grandmother raised me for a a long while, uh, when my mother was recovering from a divorce. And Mm -hmm. so going back and forth between my mom and my grandmother, you know, I'd always been very active, very creative, loved to sing, loved to dance, always wanted to be in the spotlight. And I was in theater camps. I was in, you know, regional theater productions um, since I could remember. It always been my passion. Mm -hmm. And I just tried to figure out the road to becoming, I think, an artist, a musician, a solo artist, because Mm -hmm. we all sort of have these things as entertainers and performers. You start doing one thing, but you always have like the goal of accomplishing something different, maybe within Mm -hmm. the same industry, but Mm -hmm. like, it's kind of weird when we discuss how people are known for one thing, like actors who actually sing as well. And we kind of bash them when they're like, they're an actor, they shouldn't be singing. <laughs> or they're a singer, they shouldn't be acting. You know, so sometimes that gets a little funky for me because I'm like, a lot of people who are in the entertainment industry, you know, you don't just do one thing. You know, mm-hmm. you, a lot of people do a lot of different things. Um, but I started out acting and I started out singing, singing in the church choir. Wow. And then I actually didn't start actually training to dance like professionally until like I was in high school. Um, wow. Like I started dancing professionally when I was 15 and I was training, like I was doing moonlight training with my dance teacher, um, Melissa Williams. She was teaching me with the younger kids. So I was helping assist her while learning the basics. So I was mm-hmm. double like, I was multitasking basically Mm -hmm. and moonlighting at the same time while going to school. And I just felt so passionate about it that I like all of my youth was rehearsals. Like I didn't date, I didn't do other things. I was a gymnast. I did do that for a while. Um, I thought very (laughs) that I would be, I didn't really have an interest in sports. I thought for a moment that I could play soccer, but it really wasn't for me. (laughs) And and then I played the saxophone for like a a year. Um, And I had to choose between chorus or band. And I I just wanted, I I wanted to sing. So I have been in the arts my whole life. I I find it so interesting, um, because you say you grew up in the South. Where in the South did you grow up? Columbus, Georgia. And what was, you know, you know, especially with Georgia being in the news a lot this week, um, uh, yes. how, 
how was it you know, growing up down south? You know, especially as becoming, you know, from from you know transitioning to who you are today. Like, tell me yeah. about that story. Tell me about how how was that experience? You know, one thing I like about the south, I'll start there, is that I yeah. think it the family. The fabric of, of family is very important in the South. Mm. And I like that, you know, raising children in the South, it can be really good to raise children with, you know, the ability to be around their family, to be around nature, to be around, like, you know, it's just, it's not as fast paced as like being in New York or a major city, so to yeah. speak. So that aspect of it was kind of cool, um, but it is the South. Um, very close-minded. Um, being a creative, artistic kid, I always felt different, ostracized. I always felt I was always picked on. But it was the one thing, at least, and I think this is a little bit of has to do with colorism and being black. It's like when we look at black people, we look at we look at ourselves as like these things. We're athletes. We're musicians. We're entertainers. And so those are sometimes our a way to escape being treated or mistreated a certain way so for me it was about being our uh, you know oh that's the kid who can sing that's the kid who can dance and that was my safety net that mm -hmm. was my way of being validated by people's opinions of me because they didn't approve of my you know uh the way that i acted or the way i carried myself or my identity so you know when i'm being picked on and called names at the end of the day, was it like, at least, oh, at least they can do that, or they're good at something, <laughs> essentially. And so it was tough. I just knew that I would never stay there. That was basically mm. the bottom line, is you don't get to pick where you're raised. You don't mm. get to choose that. So I just knew that, like, whenever I'm able to free myself from what felt like the shackles of this, like, really constrained way of thinking, I'm going to do it. And I knew mm. immediately when I knew that I could leave, you know, when I graduated high school, I was like, I'm going to New York. Oh, and wow. I'm going to start 18, my life. You're out. And at 18, I was out. <laughs> tell, yeah. me, tell me, tell me about what did, okay. So you left, you left Georgia at 18. Tell mm -hmm. me about that experience of coming to New York. So the school that I came to be in New York, um, is a theater, uh, academy, uh, conservatory that allowed me to live here in the city and experience the city. Mm -hmm. as well as learn and hone more, more of my craft um, mm -hmm. in, in musical theater, which is what I went to school for and what I went to study for. And so it was important for me to take the dive as soon as possible because I, would, I, I feel like my life has literally been running against the clock <laughs> because there's so much time, I think, as first of all, as Black people, I feel like time is rarely on our side because we're mm. constantly having to make up for lost time because we're not afforded certain things. So we're having to put out more energy just to be able to accomplish some of the most basic things. Mm. And I'm like, as you know, an artist, well, like I wasn't born into money. I wasn't born into the opportunity to be on like a hit show or, or, or have all of these things. So I've been chasing them. And I was like, I needed to move to New York so that I could advance myself. Mm. And I wasn't really scared. I, I, um, I moved, you know, shortly after 9-11 happened wow. and it was, you know, kind of like, why would you move there when that happened? That was a whole nother <laughs> hurdle. And I did it because I was like, I'm feeling unstoppable. Like I just, mm. you know, my life is so important to me. I'm not going to let all of these other things get in the way. And was I scared? Yeah, I was scared, but I was much more passionate than I was scared about wow. following my dreams. I, it, I mean, I'm not sure how much, how willing you are to talk about this, but can you tell us about when you decided to transition? Yeah, so uh, I always knew, I always felt like I was one of the girls. All of my friends growing up when I was young were women, were girls. Um, my connection to most men around me in school or whatever, I never felt like I understood their point of view. I always mm. felt like I was perpetrating in their experience, especially like mm. when I was in shows and I'm in dressing rooms with the, you know, the male group of actors, I'm in the corner, like covering myself, feeling invade, invaded. And I felt like I was just not in the right space. Mm. Um, I endured it because 
when you're young, you just kind of like, you listen to people and you let them dictate your life and tell you what to do, where to go, how to act. So you do what you have to do to get by. Um, but you hold on to that feeling and that emotion. So I always knew what it felt like. I didn't know how to describe it. I didn't have the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And the vocabulary came way later when, you know, maybe end of high school, uh, after I had come out identifying as gay, because that's just what it was. It was like, you're born this way and you like this. Well, that's gay. And, you know, even <laughs> in the 90s, it's like, you're dealing with the binary. It's like, mm. you're either this or that. You're, you're gay or you're straight. You're black or you're white. Like, it wasn't much conversation about the intersectionality, the nuances of being all these different things. So um, I read a lot in high school. Um, I just kind of embraced being different and unique. I was always very androgynous kind of growing up. Mm. And so I found out, like, when I started touring, um, on the road after leaving my hometown, you know, I started to see trans women. Um, aside from seeing trans women on talk shows, which was always just a really, you know, negative highlight, like Maury mm -hmm. Povich and mm -hmm. Jerry Springer um, and Ricky Lake. It was like, I couldn't connect to the, um, what's the word? I couldn't connect to the, the circus of it. Mm. I was, you know, even though this is, and this is how important it is for us to see ourselves reflected, you know, in many different ways, you know, how important it is to see yourself maybe as a black man successful, you know, as a black man, you know, loving the earth or doing different things. So I just couldn't accept the circus of it. And I just was like, I'm not like that. Mm -hmm. But what helped me realize who I was was when I finally saw some trans women in the flesh who were like multi-dimensional people, not only beautiful, but very well-spoken, very intelligent, like witty, all of the things that we look at when we see Hollywood actors and stars or like, you know, we, we idolize. It's like, oh, I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. And so I finally met like trans women touring on the road and then coming to New York. I was like, oh, it just clicked. I was like, oh, it's possible. Like to be a woman, to be fully realized and to actually be someone amazing and have a life. And then what does that look like? Where do you start? Like, how do you start that process? Mm -hmm. um, and I always say in interviews, my best friend, Laverne Cox, actually was the person that, you know, I, she gave me the tools. She was like, you can go here you can do this. These are the doctors or people that you can talk to. This is the clinic you can start, you know, learning about um, therapy, all of these things. And it was like, wow, okay. And so, I mean, the only thing I wish is I could have, you know, started my transition earlier. However, I do think things happen for a reason. So I don't mm -hmm. regret, you know, starting when I did start because I know that my life experience up to that point helped prepare me for how empowering and how powerful it would be to step into it. Because it's not something that, like, I don't take transitioning lightly. And I know that there are more people who are learning th about their transness. But I, but you know, it's one of those things that's like, you are shifting your life. You're completely shifting a lot. <laughs> and what was, what was your family's response to this decision that you made? Okay, so part of me moving too was like my way of, this is where I'm like, I think we all do this. You go away if you do, if you leave. You go away and you're like, I'm now I'm gonna start my life. And I'm gonna learn about what I want my life to be like. And I'm gonna make some mistakes. I'm gonna be with some people I shouldn't be with. I'm gonna do this, this, and this. And then I'm gonna come together and figure it out. And that's the way I think. It's like, I wanna figure out as much as I can about myself before presenting it or going to other people. And I started my transition actually before like telling my family and it wasn't until maybe like a year into it where like things were starting to change where I had to go back home for a visit and say things like, listen, you know, this is who I am. I'm, you know, tra I'm transitioning and I know I'm a woman and you're laughing now and you don't get it now, but I have to do this for me. And they did not understand. They couldn't really place it. Um, Could they understand when you when you had had identified as a, a gay man, uh, 
could they understand that or were they they didn't understand that either. I think they understood that more, yes. Okay. And I still to this day believe that there are more people who understand or accept what it kind of means to be gay mm. than they do because most people don't know a trans person. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like most people don't have a direct connection. I call it the Ellen effect. You know, Ellen came on TV and she was a lesbian and all of a sudden everyone was like, oh, that's what it is and that exists. Okay, there's a reference point. You know, um, obviously now people can refer to Laverne Cox and, and have these, these figures in, in media to say this is someone that represents how I see myself. Um, I think it was kind of like a moment of they had, we had already had a discussion and they thought that's where it was and that's, that was it mm -hmm. and that we were done. So the idea of like, wait a minute, no, let's, 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 let's backtrack and like, like let, me re let me rewind and talk to you about what's really happening. And then adding this new information to the conversation, it just kind of goes over their heads and they just don't understand. And I spoke to my mom. We had a long car ride. We did like a, a, a road trip. I broke it down for her. And her response was, as supportive as she is, her response was, was primarily, why can't you just perform and be as you are, be, you know, like put it on and take it off kind of thing. Mm. And I said, I, I get the sentiment. But that's not the truth. The truth is, is like, when I go to sleep and I wake up, I'm Mila, like 24 seven. It doesn't, it's not, it's not about hair. It's not about a dress. It's not about heels. It's not about, those are things that are accessories that, you know, color the situation. But like at the end of the day, my core and my person and my soul is Mila. Mm -hmm. And it just took her a few more, <laughs> after that conversation, maybe a few more years. I always say that I think that time heals the mm. things that we just don't know how to understand. And she came around because she started to understand how I was able to create and live and, and, and thrive and survive and, and how important it was for me to have a chosen family who supported me because that supports your argument and your, your, um, your need to claim your life and your authenticity. Mm -hmm. And so she started, she just started to get it. She started to get it and go, and that made her change all of her thoughts about what people say to her about her child. And I think it's a parent's job to listen to the child and use their own processing, you know, alongside what they, what they want for their child, but not to drown that out by like mm -hmm. the church or your friends, or what other people think. And I think that's the brilliant thing my mother was able to do, is she was able to think for herself and listen to me, and then kind of roll into like, okay, I'm starting to see, I get it. Okay, now I get it more and more. I think it's interesting because, you know, especially, you know, as we talk about Black Lives Matter um, in the last few weeks, the last couple of years, um, I know it seems brand new to a lot of companies, but um, Black mm -hmm. people have been here a long time. Uh, but especially as a Black family and your mother accepting you as, trans as a transgender woman. Um, ha I have a couple of questions. <laughs> the first one is, you know, one of the things that, that I've been examining, especially for Pride Month, is the LGBT, the T part. Have you felt a part of the LGBT, you know, et cetera, et cetera, community? Uh, yes and no. I mean, let me just tell you this. Trans women make space for themselves, ourselves. We make mm -hmm. our own space. And we have to because I think like Black women in general, in, in, in America at least, there's not a lot of people making space for us, cis mm -hmm. or trans. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for any woman to hold her own and to find her own space and to, to keep that for herself. Um, so, you know, it is nice to be um, included or to be, you know, shown uh, that you matter and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, there's so much of that work that we have to just do for ourselves that it's like when nobody cares about us, we still have to go to bed with ourselves. Mm. And the power of loving yourself as a Black trans woman is so fierce. Mm. Like, I don't understand how people can't see that. Like, mm. they would much rather mock us or kill us to prove a point that's really stupid and doesn't really exist and is a whole like illusion in the narrative that I don't subscribe to, but that like how much it takes 
to just be able to stand in your beauty, your truth, your power as a black woman, as a black trans woman, without anyone else's, you know, a grace or opinion. I think it's interesting that, and I think, and even for my own ignorance, it wasn't until maybe like the last few years that I even remembered or understood that this movement of the, you know, LGBT, you know, movement was began with a black and a Hispanic woman. Black trans woman, yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't- She's I on think, my shirt. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Marsha. <laughs> yes, Marsha. <laughs> But you know what, I, I think people don't know, and I think it's so important, especially when we're having conversations like this, to remind people that this movement uh, began with a Black trans woman and right. an Hispanic trans woman. Right. Um, but you have to I, remember, when we're talking about this, and I think it's great that we are not, we're having more conversations about this, Yeah. but we have to really look at the infrastructure of what it means to not only be Black in this country, but what it means to be different and black in this country and to be even further othered because so much of our blackness has rested on the back of like this doctrination like this this doctrine of like this is what god is this is what you are supposed to know about it and how you're supposed to you know present and the protocol and the the guise of religion and who we answer to and our structure the social structure of like the church and mm -hmm. our communion in the church is like the beauty of like let's just say the beauty of the black church is congregating the togetherness mm -hmm. i'm here for that that is the beauty of it to me but then the rhetoric that kind of comes behind why you're gathering it just totally omits the, re the lived experience of our black brothers and sisters that are not cis heteronormative, that are different, that are trans. We all know this in black churches across America. There's tons of LGBTQ queer people in the black mm. church mm -hmm. that are constantly having to be silenced, having to act a certain way, having to be hidden, having to be underneath. Having, I mean, I could go on and on and on about it. I refuse mm -hmm. to be that person. I lived through it. Mm -hmm. And my relationship with religion and all that stuff sh shifted dramatically because of the way I was treated. And it didn't make sense. It didn't match up. And I'm like, how do we match this up with allowing our queer brothers and sisters to be, to be seen and be supportive? Um, yeah. How, 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 you know, especially this week, and I, and I think it's important, especially when we speak to the Black community in regards to Black Lives Matter, and, I, and I've noticed a lot more people, including myself, that are saying, okay, that's important, but just as important, Black trans lives matter, because that is a horrific and persistent issue of Black trans women being murdered. You know, it feels like to me when... I'm, 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 I like, sometimes I'm really great at analogies and sometimes I'm not. And I'm just going for this. <laughs> when you win a prize and, you know, you are used to getting, it's like, it's like getting a happy meal and you know, you win a toy. Like there's a little toy prize in it and you're like, oh, I got a little toy. It's like having the inclusive, like including transness and black transness in this, in these conversations right now. And people really like hearing people who would never say it, say it. It's a prize that's bigger than a toy. It's a prize that's like, you're getting, you know, this free meal for, for the rest of your life. It is encouraging and it's, it's, it's exciting, but like, it also comes with baggage. It comes with the fear that like, how many of you really believe this? How many of you are really, really, really gonna stick to this and, mm -hmm. and, and use this? And, and I know it's convenient and it's cute and it's trendy to say black trans lives matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, saying the word trans, has is been super difficult for lots of people. You know, having the vocabulary around what it means to be trans, people saying transgendered, which is not the way you use the word. It's just like, okay, we're all trying and I'm here for that try. Also, how do we stay persistent? How do we stay? It is, it's, it's a diet. It's a diet. You have to continue to practice it. It doesn't just fix itself and go away. And then what's even more important is our partners, trans amorous partners, people that are into trans people that don't know they're into trans people and end up finding out that they are. 
are you able to make space for us and talk about us? Because mm. we have been the secret. We have been the secret for since the beginning of time. We're still the secret. We will continue to be the secret in so many respects, but it really makes me feel like I want to see that change. Like, how do we change that? And I think it's an interesting point that you bring up in regards to um, relationships. What, what has dating been, been like for you? It's been a circus. Um, <laughs> it's been all kinds of things. I, w I would say there's different angles I could go into, but one angle I want to present is before the tipping point, before awareness and, and people seeing trans people on TV and ads or whatever, there was a little bit of a prouder expression from men, people that are not trans that actually like us and that date us mm -hmm. because it wasn't talked about and you didn't have people scrutinizing what or who you were with. And so let's just say if you're a trans woman that doesn't look trans or it's passable, like, you know, some people say, I, you know, could date a guy and it just would not be talked about. Like we would have those intimate conversations, but it wouldn't be talked about to like their friends and their family and no one would really know. And guys are so good, speaking about straight cis men, are so good about being like, I don't like people in my business anyway. I don't want people to know what I do anyway. There's such, that's such a narrative in mm -hmm. black, I mean, in uh, cis men's experiences mm -hmm. that you just kind of accept that. And you're just happy that someone's like trying to show up for you. And you're happy mm -hmm. that maybe someone took you to dinner and someone, you know, likes your body and all that stuff. Now that people know and can see you and there's a conversation around it, I think it's scared men even more. It's made them even more distant and really? more likely to not want to associate because now it means something because people have something to reference it to you know what i mean mm -hmm. so that makes it even more difficult you really have to be secure like a man has to really be secure to be able to say i not only date trans women or i date women whether they're trans or not and people in my family and in my life know that and it is what it is i mean and i don't say this to say that it doesn't come with backlash but like imagine the backlash we've had to deal with just to be ourselves mm -hmm. so don't come preaching to us about how you know, it's just really tough to tell my dad. It's just really tough to tell my mom and like how they would feel about it. We know, boo, we've done that. We did that. We're doing that. Sorry, it gets me worked up. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> because, and first of all, I, I want to say, because, you know, just like myself as a black person, I can't speak for all black people and you can't speak for all right. trans people. We're not people. a monolith and we know all are not all the same. Exactly. You know, so this is, this is your experience. And I thought it was important though, um, because we are, people dating is the same in a lot of different ways amongst all of us <laughs> you know um but but then let me add this to the conversation mm -hmm. you know i meet guys everywhere online i mean i feel like dating online has been is good for trans women because we can disclose and we can be you know have a level of safety and say what we need to say when we need to say it i still believe that a trans woman should be able to say it when she needs to and wants to mm -hmm. i don't like this idea that we owe it to you or have to tell you because I think that narrative should shift based on like mm. every man needs to know that it's possible. You might meet a trans woman and might be into her and you might like her. We need to stop having these conversations that like we don't exist and that you would never be into us. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that a lot of guys, you know, just want to enjoy and, 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 and you know, if they like you, they like you. But like we're telling our white friends right now during Black Lives Matter movement, you got to do some hard shit. You got to have some hard conversations if you mm -hmm. want to reap some benefits. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see some things, you know, move in your favor, I mean, you have to do a little bit of work. Yeah. So there are guys out there, they're very rare, but some guys are open to and open-minded enough and have done some work on themselves, are continuing to do work. Um, there are guys out there who are just terrified. They just don't know what to do. And I can tell that they're, they wish that they could, mm -hmm. you know, be more, I guess, I guess, safe, safer, knowing that they are open to dating trans women. And um, I've just learned to just sort of weed out what I don't need to deal with. And I think that's every individual trans woman's job is to figure out how much are you willing to put up with? I've put up with a lot. 
<laughs> what are you not willing to put up with now? Uh, well, at this point, I'm not willing to put up with this, you know, the secretive thing, the, you know, the, the, I like you, but I don't want anyone to know thing, um, the down low thing. Um, a lot of this comes from being really centered and happy with my life and just where I'm going and I'm busy and I have things that I'm doing and things that I'm working on and accomplishing and that I'm creating a legacy. And there are a lot of fuck boys and there are a lot of guys who don't know what they want and don't want. And that was my other point. A lot of men don't even know if they want relationships and don't want relationships. So right there, it's a, this is a conversation that me and my sisters that are not trans can have all day, every day. Mm -hmm. It's trying to find men who want relationships and are actually open to building something with you. So many of them don't, it doesn't matter if you're trans or not because they don't want anything anyway. Mm. What, is, what is something, speaking of the Mila that was back in Georgia, what mm -hmm. is something now that you know that you would have told her back then? Mm. It doesn't have to be one thing either. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if this really answers the question, but I'll say this. What fascinates me is being in a moment and knowing that you can smell it, touch it, taste it, and it's still not there yet, and that you really, really want it. And then what it feels like to appreciate it when you actually do get to experience it. And so mm -hmm. what I would tell her is that you have the ability, it will happen and it can happen. It will, you know, the time frame is whatever because it can be a very long time, but you will get there and what you're doing is important for not only yourself, but other people. It's hard to know that when you're not seeing yourself represented, when you just have to feel that on your own. And I always say like, I have a meal and jam growing up and I wish that I had something like that. I don't know how many people may look up to me if that's their business, if they want to or not. But like, it is nice to see people that we can look up to that are inspiring. I think, you know, we want to be inspired. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now that we fast forward and we're here, Meal Jam, the music, the career, you know, let's, let's talk about your current music. Like, what are you working on now? What do people have to look forward to? So I'm, I'm like creating music all the time. You know, I think the process of writing and making music that's, you know, up for like public consumption, it takes a lot longer than people realize. You don't just mm. write a song. And then <laughs> the next day, it's like, like the song that you just released, you didn't write last week. You know, sometimes it takes months, sometimes it takes years. And it, to me, it's always about what resonates with what's going on in the world in the moment. I mean, as someone who like, I do, do draw some inspiration from the, con the idea set of like a Nina Simone who like, thinks about, you know, artists should be reflecting the times. So as a black trans woman, how I encounter dating, how I am treated, and how important it is for me to make music that I feel like can be empowering. I think that it needs to be empowerment for women that are not trans, for trans women, for some men, for people just to feel like they can, you know, relate to a voice they didn't think they would be able to relate to. Mm -hmm. And I have some new music, you know, coming out. Well, we're still deciding what new music we want to put out. I've been recording lots of stuff. I've been working on some duets, um, international duets with, with, you know, humans that are from different cultures and backgrounds, which is so cool to me. Um, and even the music that I have already, introducing that to a new audience, because in the last week alone, I've, my following has grown extensively from marching and protesting and speaking and you know speaking out at rallies about trans rights and stuff and so i've gained a whole new following of people who didn't even know i existed <laughs> mm, mm. so and you the catalog is there and as i move forward it's just to continue writing music that i think feels good sounds good is empowering and does reflect the things that i go through that like i know are important to me that are important to other people I know you mentioned um, that you'll be, you'll be working with some international um, artists. What is the, the difference between putting out music here and working with people outside the U.S.? 
Well, the thing is, is like, I think most people outside of the U.S., they look to the U.S. for what is important, hot, new, the, the trend. Mm -hmm. um, people idolize the U.S. like you would never believe. And it sucks because when we live here, we all, we see the, we see behind the curtain. <laughs> Sure. And that's kind of crazy knowing what it like, what it looks like being here on the home front and then seeing how everyone else looks at us. Um, but what I like is like, you know, the risks that people will take, you know, overseas in different cultures. I'm working with an artist um, that's, a she's Asian and, you know, collaborating with someone from the Asian community. I know that they have a very, strong connection to like even black culture and black music and whatnot. And so I'm singing in Mandarin, you know, wow. like there's moments where it's just really cool um, to just, I love, like, I love the idea of being able to diversify and do things with different people in different cultures. I think that's, that's what we should do. Mm -hmm. And so I just like some of the risks that people will take because here in the States, you know, music is a very specific, it has to look this way, be this way, sound this way, package this way. Um, and yeah, I think that's what, what it is for me. The, the, you know, there's a lot of companies, as I mentioned earlier, that are coming forward and, and putting money behind different charities that are black focused and in community and things like that. But I want to talk about in regards to something that Khalees had said on on her social media where she was calling out a lot of these major record labels for you know, not, not supporting black artists and how about you give black artists some of the money that you owe them. What, is, what are your thoughts, especially as a trans woman, you know, we don't, we, I don't think we've ever seen a trans woman that's on a major label doing, you know, major label things. Well, we have seen a trans woman. We do have someone in the community that is doing major label things. Uh, her name is Kim Petrus. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. She's mm -hmm. uh, a singer from Germany, a yeah. uh, white girl. And I've actually followed her career for a very long time. So like she has put in the work. It's like mm -hmm. you, it's not just an overnight success. Mm -hmm. um, however, we do not have majorly successful black trans women. Um, hello, here I am. <laughs> and, but like, just as much as Khalees says that, someone who's had major representation and a major mm -hmm. career, that just highlights to you how deep it is that like it would be for someone like me to get major representation or a major label to sign me. Um, what I think needs to happen is I think these major labels deserve queer, let me reword that, they need to take a risk and, and see that there's a movement a movement in the queer community and in the queer black and brown community of artists that people are listening to and that that they want to see want to see mm -hmm. thrive and flourish and i think for so often there's queer people behind the scenes of cis major artists designing them styling them choreographing them vocal coaching them and we don't have representation representation on the major front line of mm -hmm. that from the community and I think we need that. Queer icons need to be queer. Yeah. You know, yes. I don't think that they cannot not be queer. I don't think that, you know, you can't, I, you know, I'm here for Cher. I'm here for whatever, Judy Garland and all of these other people. But like, why can't we have that spot, that space, you know, inhabited by the people who actually are like myself, you know, marching and protesting and fighting and with a message and resonating with people on a real human level because our humanity is always questioned. So I think that's, mm -hmm. no one ever thought hip hop and rap would be popular music, but it is. Uh, so I, I think know. queer music, and, and when I even say queer music, it doesn't even just sound a certain way for you to say it's queer, you mm -hmm. know? It's music that's nuanced, but it's music that has whatever the flares of all the things we listen to just created by people with a different experience that I think people are ready for. Major labels, like come together and step up. Like that's my opinion. Do you, do you think now with everyone bringing this sort of issue to the forefront, you, you, we're going to start to see see that? Because you, even you said that you started to see a lot. If these companies are you. smart, like even with these labels and these companies, if they're smart, they would not be tone deaf. 
and they will listen to the ground and listen to the people, listen to people what want what people want. I know it's all a numbers game and they want to go based off of like, well, if you don't have 8 billion streams, then like, you know, we no one care. I think what we're longing for is for like, listen, people that sort of, and I know it's a different time, but like it, in the creation of some of the biggest icons, you know, there were people that saw something. They saw something that there was there that they could work with and that could, could you know, manifest and create into something that people would really want to see. And Britney Spears didn't have tons of, you know, views or whatever before she came out. She was obviously manufactured, but people, she was, people were told to look at her because of these heads of the label or these people who started it. And when you have queer LGBT artists doing that on their own and, and people are tuning in without major representation, think about how powerful it could be for little black queer and you know, queer kids to see that on major levels. I think that, that we, they need that. I think it's important, especially for you know, the black and brown community, because I, I recall India Reid this week speaking about how I white love artists are, are treated differently in comparison to uh, black artists. And she's, and she's saying all these white artists are inspired by these black artists. You know, use your privilege and post about them. Um, so, but see, we're all in a game, and then this is, comes into the conversation of being being in a system and in an industry where, like, it is about competition. It is competitive. You know, it is like who's selling more records, who's more hot, who's more this, who's more that. And so, I think part of the mentality, which is similar to the race game, is a lot of those white people thinking that it's an even playing field, and that they mm -hmm. that they shouldn't have to do anything, and that like. They've worked hard, so you just got to keep working hard too, and you'll get there too. But we're like, it's disproportionate, so you mm -hmm. don't understand. Like it just. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping now, uh, now that we're really, you know, talking about Black Lives Matter, and we're we're talking about how the system of racism has set Black culture behind uh, in comparison to, you know, non-Black people. Um, so I think th it, that uh, that conversation has to sort of you know, like a system of os osmosis to go into other areas like the music industry, like, yeah. you know, other industries, but specifically mm -hmm. music, because you can see it. You can see an artist like Adele, and then you see artists like an Indiari pretty much making similar music, but making very far less uh, right. in regards to that, even though they- But it's they also because of who music. can- Right, and it's, who, it's about who controls the narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, the narrative is controlled by a few, a handful of people who literally say, well, my children listen to this and this is what I want people to hear. You know, if Timmy listens to Taylor Swift, then I want Taylor Swift to be in every household. And that's who, you know, I, I do feel like even with like these labels, record labels or whatever, if they do have kids, I know a lot of them will, will kind of be like, you know, well, who do you like and who do you listen to? Because they don't know anything. They don't mm -hmm. know anything. They're not like, digging and finding out who's connected with with um, their fans and the audiences on the ground. They're just mm -hmm. like, who can you recommend? Mm -hmm. Who can you tell me is like, what's the new thing? And whatever that kid says, that's who they put, that's who they quote unquote put on. And that's why it's important to have a seat at the table. That's why it's important for these labels to start incorporating these, uh, you know. And that's what we're talking color. about with Black Lives Matter. So having, mm -hmm. not only having a seat at the table, it's mm. like owning a part of the table. Like that's where we True. even need to go. It's not even enough to just give us a seat anymore. Yeah. So even as a black queer person, I don't want just a seat. We've just, I've been talking about to people about crumbs. It's like, you know, why can't my song be playing on the radio? Mm. As it should be. But you know what it is, like we were just saying, not only do we not have a seat at the table, we don't even own the table. Or a part of the table. We don't own any part of the table. We don't own the nail that holds the table together. We don't own the paint that painted the table. We don't own anything. And we're lucky if we get to see the table and, and look at it and go, oh, that's what the table looks like. Okay. <laughs> but speaking more about your music, mm -hmm. the music, we already knew the music industry has a lot of ways to go in regards to right. how it treats uh, you know, minorities. Um, but let's talk about Mila Jam. And, we know you're working on a lot of different music. We've seen yeah. uh, some of your music videos recently. Um, what do you want to do next? 
Where do you see I, New listen, Orleans? Listen, I really would love, okay, so it has been a dream of mine to, to do a record, to, to do a full, like to, to do an album. I've never, I don't have an album out. I have an EP out with um, some tracks on it and I've done a lot of singles. Um, the game has sort of shifted a lot. So it's not, you know, we're not really in the time of album sales of people going to buy albums. Mm -hmm. So that does affect my desire to like put out an album because in my heart of hearts, I would want to put out something that people really want, that people mm -hmm. would want to hear. And I don't want it to be for my ego, you know, because I think as a musician, it's very easy to have the ego in you say, I'm an artist and a musician and a recording artist, and I have an album, and here's my album, and did you buy it, and did you listen to it? I was like, I don't want to do that. I want people to really want to, to hear it and to listen to it and to know. Um, and so until that time comes, I don't know when that time will come, but until that time comes, I'm, I'm really invested in making songs that reflect the experience of a Black trans woman you know, of someone that has been, a, you know, around and seen a lot of different things that loves R&B, pop, soul, dance, music. Um, yeah, that's what I want. You know, hopefully we'll get to that point soon, sooner than later, but the business sort of does dictate how, you know, I'm not Ariana Grande and I'm not Beyonce and I'm not Justin Bieber, you know, and they could just drop whatever they're singing in the shower and people will buy it. <laughs> You know, so I really I'm all about curating something that I feel like is really powerful. I, someone asked me what I was listening to in another dis panel discussion during this time. And I was saying I've been listening to, to Rhythm Nation because mm. at that time when Janet, who is a, obviously a huge influence of mine, you know, she did something that was so like relevant to what was going on. But like people were so like, you're just supposed to be making music that makes us just feel good and just talks about whatever. And she was, it was a movement, you know, and it's still relevant today. Mm. You know, it was still like the state of the world. It's like, it's still relevant, like crazy. So I want to make something that outlives me. Mm. Most definitely. Um, I'm, I'm going to let you go in a little bit, but before I like, I, first of all, I really do appreciate you taking the time to do this interview and t talk about not just the music, talk about your experience um, with the music industry, with life, with men, um, but with the music and the industry, like what keeps you motivated to keep going and, and to keep doing it? <laughs> I was just talking to someone about this the other day. Um, what is interesting in life is the more you work towards something, the longer you persevere, the closer you get. And it's always that feeling of, well, if I would have stopped, I wouldn't have gotten this opportunity. Mm. So there's no stopping. Mm. Uh, and, that, and that's how I, I feel like D Diddy right now. Like, ain't no stop. <laughs> <I'm just> stopping. <laughs> but like, I like literally like, there are no Mila jams in the major music industry. So like, why not be, be the one and why not go for it? And maybe I'll be 50 before anyone gives me a shot to win a Grammy or anything, you know? And maybe, you know, no one will take me seriously until at this point I have com I'm committed. I'm committed to being like, I love seeing my JLo's and my Janet's and all the girls who are out there doing stuff and defeating the odds of, what age you have to be to be a, mm. uh, you know, a, a performer, a pop star, a musician. So now that that has kind of happened, I'm kind of like, well, throwing that out the window, like who freaking cares, you know? Mm. But just continuing to push, because if you don't continue to push, you just get stagnant and you just decay. So like, I think pushing forward and whatever, if I have 10 singles, 20 singles, 30 singles, just keep doing it until like, it's done. I'm just gonna just strive for greatness. Like, and I think that's what I would want people to know about women like myself. That's also what I want them to know about the black experience. We are constantly striving for greatness. So I'm here for mm. the long haul. 
<laughs> what advice would you give to a young person that may be listening to you right now and they're maybe they're in your little town in, in Georgia mm -hmm. having the same feelings that you were having back there. What advice would you give them? To I would survive? say to, I would say to anyone that is sort of listening and just thinking about dreaming and where they would go. Remember the moment that you're in where it is not what you want it to be because you have the power to change it and to get there is real it will take time and it will take a lot of no hard ache whatever not working out i have done you know when you hear stories about like even just in music you hear stories about people being like i played in sh you know shitty dive bars where no one showed up and da -da 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 -da. yeah well i played them twice as long as you did you know or like mm. and and so when you're able to say that and you've gotten you know you've done all of that when you get to a place where you've always imagined, you've done the work, mm. you know? And then even when you've gotten there and done the work, you realize that the work isn't done. So like you continue to do the work and you continue to make, hopefully make it better. So when someone says don't give up, that means it is a long friggin' road. <laughs> but if you're really passionate about it, don't give up. Thank you, Mila. I really do appreciate you taking the time to do this interview and we're excited. We're going to be playing all of Mila's music here on the Kempire Radio Network. Uh, and we really appreciate you coming on the show and maybe the next time you come on, you will have a major record deal for us. Ashe, I thank you and it was wonderful to talk to you. Please be safe. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for giving me this space. And I love it, jam on. <laughs>